Welcome to A Year of War and Peace. I'm your host, Bryony e. Denton. A Year of War and Peace is a daily, year-long, chapter-by-chapter reading of and meditation on Leo Tolstoy's epic novel, War and Peace. In these videos and podcasts, you'll be treated to a free reading of one chapter per day of the novel, plus a reflective essay I've written individually tailored to that day's chapter. These readings are offered for free, though if you'd like to support me, you can do so in one of three ways. First, you could purchase my ebook, A Year of War and Peace. It features the entire novel, plus all of my reflective essays, and it's only $2.99 on Amazon.com. You could also become a patron at patreon.com slash Brian E. Denton. If you sign up there, you'll receive a sonnet once a month, plus a link to an ebook of my collected sonnets. Finally, if you like, you can make a one-time donation to my PayPal account. The email there is brianedenton at gmail.com. You can also use that email to contact me. I'd be happy to hear from you. Your support is greatly appreciated. Today's reading is Chapter 3 of War and Peace, followed by a reflective essay on the same. Chapter 3 Anna Pavlovna's reception was in full swing. The spindles hummed steadily and ceaselessly on all sides. With the exception of the aunt, beside whom sat only one elderly lady, who with her thin, careworn face was rather out of place in this brilliant society, the whole company had settled into three groups. One, chiefly masculine, had formed around the abbey. Another, of young people, was grouped around the beautiful Princess Helene, Prince Vasily's daughter, and the little Princess Bolkonskaya, very pretty and rosy, though rather too plump for her age. The third group was gathered around Montmartre, and Anna Pavlovna. The Vicomte was a nice-looking young man with soft features and polished manners, who evidently considered himself a celebrity, but out of politeness modestly placed himself at the disposal of the circle in which he found himself. Anna Pavlovna was obviously serving him up as a treat to her guests, as a clever maître de hôtel serves up as a specially choice delicacy a piece of meat that no one who had seen it in the kitchen would have cared to eat, so Anna Pavlovna served up to her guest, first the vicomte and then the abbe, as particularly choice morsels. The group around Montmartre immediately began discussing the murder of the Duc d'Agnon. The vicomte said that the Duc d'Agnon had perished by his own magnanimity, and that there were particular reasons for Bonaparte's hatred of him. Ah, oh, yes, do tell us about it, vicomte, said Anna Pavlovna, with a pleasant feeling that there was something a la Louis XV and the sound of that sentence. Tell us something, Vicomte. The Vicomte bowed and smiled courteously in token of his willingness to comply. Anna Pavlovna arranged a group around him, inviting everyone to listen to his tale. The Vicomte knew the Duke personally, whispered Anna Pavlovna to one of her guests. The Vicomte is a wonderful raconteur, said she to another. How evidently he belongs to the best society, she said to a third and the vicomte was served up to the company in the choicest and most advantageous style, like a well-garnished joint of roast hot beef on a hot dish. The vicomte wished to begin his story, and gave a subtle smile. Come over here, Helene, dear, said Anna Pavlovna to the beautiful young princess who was sitting some way off, the center of another group. The princess smiled. She rose with the same unchanging smile with which she had first entered the room, the smile of a perfectly beautiful woman. With the slight rustle of her white dress trimmed with moss and ivy, with a gleam of white shoulders, glossy hair, and sparkling diamonds, she passed between the men who made way for her, not looking at any of them, but smiling on all, as if graciously allowing each the privilege of admiring her beautiful figure and shapely shoulders, back and bosom, which in the fashion of those days was very much exposed. And she seemed to bring the glamour of a ballroom with her as she moved towards Anna Pavlovna. Helene was so lovely that not only did she not show any trace of coquetry, but on the contrary, she even appeared shy of her unquestionable and all too victorious beauty. She seemed to wish, but to be unable, to diminish its effect. How lovely, said everyone who saw her, and the vicomte lifted his shoulders and drooped his eyes as if startled by something extraordinary when she took her seat opposite and beamed upon him also with her unchanging smile. Madame... I doubt my ability before such an audience, said he, smilingly inclining his head. The princess rested her bare arm on a little table and considered a reply unnecessary. 
She smilingly waited. At the time the story was being told, she sat upright, glancing now at her beautiful round arm, altered in shape by its pressure on the table, now at her still more beautiful bosom, on which she readjusted a diamond necklace. From time to time she smoothed the folds of her dress, and whenever the story produced an effect she glanced at Anna Pavlovna, at once adopted just the expression she saw on the maid of honor's face, and again relapsed into her radiant smile. The little princess had also left the tea table and followed Helene. Wait a moment, I'll get my work. Now then, what are you thinking of? She went on, turning to Prince Hippolyte. Hippolyte, fetch me my work bag. There was a general movement as the princess, smiling and talking merrily to everyone at once, sat down and gaily arranged herself in her seat. Now I'm all right, she said. And asking the vicomte to begin, she took up her work. Prince Hippolyte, having brought the work bag, joined the circle and moving a chair close to her, seated himself beside her. Le charmant Hippolyte was surprising by his extraordinary resemblance to his beautiful sister, but yet more by the fact that in spite of this resemblance, he was exceedingly ugly. His features were like his sister's, but while in her case everything was lit up by a joyous, self-satisfied, youthful, and constant smile of animation, and by the wonderful classic beauty of her figure, his face, on the contrary, was dulled by imbecility and a constant expression of sullen self-confidence, while his body was thin and weak. His eyes, nose, and mouth all seemed puckered into a vacant, wearied grimace, and his arms and legs always fell into unnatural positions. "'It's not going to be a ghost story,' said he, sitting down beside the princess and hastily adjusting his longrette, as if without this instrument he could not begin to speak. "'Why, no, my dear fellow,' said the astonished narrator, shrugging his shoulders." "'Because I hate ghost stories,' said Princess Hippolyte, in a tone which showed that he only understood the meaning of his words after he had uttered them. He spoke with such self-confidence that his hearers could not be sure whether what he said was very witty or very stupid. He was dressed in a dark green dress coat, knee breeches of the color of the frightened nymph's thigh, as he called it, shoes and silk stockings. The Vicomte told his tale very neatly. It was an anecdote then current to the effect that the Duc d'Aignan had gone secretly to Paris to visit Mademoiselle Georges, that at her house he had come upon Bonaparte, who also enjoyed the famous actress's favors, and that in his presence Napoleon happened to fall into one of the fainting fits to which he was subject, and was thus at the Duke's mercy. The later spared him, and this magnanimity Bonaparte subsequently repaid by death. The story was very pretty and interesting especially at the point where the rivals suddenly recognized one another, and the ladies looked agitated. Charming, said Anna Pavlovna, with an inquiring glance at the little princess. Charming, whispered the little princess, sticking the needle into her work as if to testify that the interest and fascination of the story prevented her from going on with it. The vicomte appreciated this silent praise, and smiling gratefully, prepared to continue. But just then Anna Pavlovna, who had kept a watchful eye on the young man who so alarmed her, noticed that he was talking too loudly and vehemently with the ab, abbe, so she hurried to the rescue. Pierre had managed to start a conversation with the abbe about the balance of power, and the latter, evidently interested by the young man's simple-minded eagerness, was explaining his pet theory. Both were talking and listening too eagerly and too naturally, which was why Anna Pavlovna disapproved. Uh, the means are the balance of power in Europe and the rights of the people, the abbey was saying, it is only necessary for one powerful nation, like Russia, barbaric as she is said to be, to place herself disinterestedly at the head of an alliance, having for its object the maintenance of the balance of the power in Europe, and that would save the world. But how are you to get that balance? Pierre was beginning. At that moment, Anna Pavlovna came up, and looking severely at Pierre, asked in Italian how he stood Russian climate. The Italian's face instantly changed and assumed an offensively affected, sugary expression, evidently habitual to him when conversing with women. I am so enchanted by the brilliancy of the wit and culture of the society, more especially of the feminine society in which I have the honor of being received, that I have not yet had time to think of the climate, said he. Not letting the Abbey and Pierre escape, Anna Pavlovna, the more conveniently to keep them under observation, brought them into the larger circle. Just then, another visitor entered the drawing room, 
Prince Andrew Bokonski, the little princess's husband. He was a very handsome young man, of medium height, with firm, clear-cut features. Everything about him, from his weary, bored expression to his quiet, measured step, offered a most striking contrast to his quiet little wife. It was evident that he not only knew everyone in the drawing room, but had found them to be so tiresome that it wearied him to look at or listen to them. And among all these faces that he found so tedious, none seemed to bore him so much as that of his pretty wife. He turned away from her with a grimace that distorted his handsome face, kissed Anna Pavlovna's hand, and screwing up his eyes, scanned the whole company. You are off to war, prince, said Anna Pavlovna. General Kutusov, said Bolkonsky, speaking French, and stressing the last syllable of the general's name like a Frenchman. General Kutusov has been pleased to take me as an aide-de-camp. And Liza, your wife? She will go to the country. Are you not ashamed to deprive, of, to deprive us of your charming wife? Andre, said his wife, addressing her husband in the same coquettish manner in which she spoke to other men. The Vicomte has been telling us such a tale about Mademoiselle Georges and Bonaparte. Prince Andrew screwed up his eyes and turned away. Pierre, who from the moment Prince Andrew entered the room had watched him with glad, affectionate eyes, now came up and took his arm. Before he looked round, Prince Andrew frowned again, expressing his annoyance with whoever was touching his arm, but when he saw Pierre's beaming face, he gave him an unexpectedly kind and pleasant smile. There now, so you too are in the great world, he said to Pierre. I knew you would be here, replied Pierre. I will come to supper with you, may I? He added in a low voice so as not to disturb the vicomte who was continuing his story. No, impossible, said Prince Andrew, laughing and pressing Pierre's hand to show that there was no need to ask the question. He wished to say something more, but at that moment Prince Vasily and his daughter got up to go and the two young men rose to let them pass. You must excuse me, dear vicomte, said Prince Vasily to the Frenchman, holding him down by the sleeve in a friendly way to prevent his rising. This unfortunate fete at the ambassador's deprives me of a pleasure and obliges me to interrupt you. I am very sorry to leave your enchanting party, said he, turning to Anna Pavlovna. His daughter, Princess Helene, passed between the chairs, lightly holding up the folds of her dress, and the smile shone still more radiantly on her beautiful face. Pierre gazed at her with rapturous, almost frightened eyes as she passed him. Very lovely, said Prince Andrew. Very, said Pierre. And passing Prince Vasily, seized Pierre's hand and said to Anna Pavlovna, Educate this bear for me. He has been staying with me a whole month, and this is the first time I have seen him in society. Nothing is so necessary for a young man as the society of clever women. And that concludes the reading of chapter 3 of War and Peace. I'll now proceed to the reflection on that chapter. A Year of War and Peace, Day 3. Prince Andrew Bokonski. The party is on, and has divided itself into three distinct groups. The first group, composed chiefly of men, gathers around the Abbey Morio. Another group, mostly young people, centers around the two beautiful young women of the party, Helene and the Princess Bolkonskaya. Lastly, there is a group gathered around the Vicomte Montmartre and Anna Pavlovna. Anna Pavlovna quickly invites Helene over to listen to Montmartre's intriguing story about Napoleon, the Duc d'Aignan, and Mademoiselle Georges. Helene complies, and Princess Bolkonskaya follows. Anna Pavlovna is pleased with her amenability, and she can't get too comfortable yet, because across the room she notices that the troublesome Pierre is now involved in a heated discussion with the Abbe Morio. The topic of their discussion is the European balance of power. Aware of Pierre's divisive political opinions, Anna Pavlovna, to the obvious displeasure of the Abbe, changes the topic uh, of conversation to the weather. Then she invites them both into a larger conversation headed by Montmartre. At this point, the second of our five major characters enter Anna Pavlovna's drawing room. This is Prince Andrew Bokonsky, husband of the Princess Bolkonskaya. Our first impression of the young Prince Bokonsky is not a positive one. He's a bit nasty. He acts bored, weary, and irritated that he must attend parties like this. In fact, only two things seem to give him any pleasure whatsoever. The first is that he'll soon be leaving this wretched society and going off to war, serving as an aide-de-camp to General Kutusov. The second is his friend Pierre, who, who he invites to supper with him later in the evening. Compare and contrast the Bokonsky couple. The wife, Princess Liza, is warm and kind. She takes an active interest in the party, 
and models her behavior on her host so as not to upset anyone. Her husband, Prince Andrew, however, is the complete opposite. It's obvious he disdains having to interact with the people of Petersburg society. Clearly, it makes him unhappy that he must engage in these social necessities. I think that's something we all experience. We often find ourselves in unavoidable and intolerable situations. So what is to be done? The great Roman Seneca offers something to meditate on. Daily Meditation All life is slavery. Let each man, therefore, reconcile himself to his lot, complain of it as little as possible, and lay hold of whatever good lies within his reach. No condition can be so wretched that an impartial mind can find no compensations in it. Small sites, if ingeniously divided, may be made use of for many different purposes, and arrangement will render ever so narrow a room habitable. Call good sense to your aid against difficulties. It is possible to soften what is harsh, to widen what is narrow, and to make heavy burdens press less severely upon one who bears them skillfully. Seneca. Peace of mind. All right, thanks for listening today and for joining me. Remember that if you'd like to support me, you can do so either by purchasing my ebook, A Year of War and Peace, becoming a patron at patreon.com, or making a one time donation to my PayPal account. The links to all that are below. Tomorrow, we'll be reading Chapter 4 of War and Peace and reflecting on the same. I hope you'll join me. Until then, take care of yourselves and of others.